Good morning. If you're, I hope that most of you are actually just still up from last night. <laughs> Otherwise, you're getting up way too early. Um, my name is Rob Graham. Uh, this is Paul McMillan and Dan Tentler. Hello. Uh, they're busy getting our demo working, making sure we can demo live stuff. Um, we're going to talk today about scanning the entire internet, which really isn't a, a huge technological development, but um, it's something that tools really haven't existed before. And they're really easy tools to create and we just haven't bothered. But we started creating these tools because now we can go to ISPs and get gigabit connections to the internet. And the internet's pretty small. It's only four billion addresses. So this is really an exciting thing to do, is to sit down on your command line using Nmap style options and just say, I want to scan the subnet, the slash zero subnet. And immediately start getting results back. Just watching your screen just flow and flow and flow and flow. Um, why scan the internet? Well, if you're a defender, it's really actually an important thing to do. Um, a lot of people have used mass scan to scan for heart bleed on their own networks because um, a lot of scanning tools just don't support the scale. If they have hundreds of thousands of systems, most vulnerability scanning tools uh, just can't handle the scale. MAP does a much better job but still hundreds of thousands of systems, it's really slow. Um, but mass scan, you just type it in and just a few minutes later 100,000 systems get scanned and you find all your heart bleed vulnerable systems. Or we have other really important answers we need to solve about the internet right now like amplification attacks with DDoS that people have been using such as the NTP servers that have been misconfigured. To solve those we need to scan everything on the internet to find them. Or when like D-Link announces a vulnerability in its, in its home routers, we'll scan the internet looking for all those D-Link servers to say how big of a botnet problem does that present to us. Or like again with Hardbleed, scan all the SSL certificates in use to see how old they are and if they've been regenerated since the bug. Um, and there's also the offensive reason. Um, it, it's the deep net and that's the kind of a popular term these days of um, things that you can't find by, by Googling them. So uh, with mass scan you just um, scan with the banners option and you will find hackable systems with, within minutes. Uh, and for us, most of us are white hat researchers and from the offensive side, it's a lot of fun. It's informative. Um, we really don't appreciate how small the internet is until we've typed in slash zero and run our scan. Also, there's 65,000 ports out there. Um, pick one at random and you'll find something new that no one's ever found before. Like a Siemens control system that controls a nuclear power plant or, or something. Uh, the talk after this one in this room, um, there's a uh, home automation, I don't even know what the talk was about. I, to get the exact details, but it was like a port 7468 or something like that that, he, that they, they scanned for and found millions of vulnerable systems. So uh, pick a port, start scanning for it, see what the heck you get. Do a black hat talk or a DEF CON talk. Who, who remembers the uh, iPhone port that just came out recently, the iPhone backdoor port? It's like 65, 62,000 something. I'm going to scan it right now. I just can't remember what the port is. Somebody shout it. Anybody remember? No? Uh, I guess okay. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Worth a shot. Sorry, go on. <laughs> um, so, so lots of people say, okay, now you've excited me about scanning the whole internet. I really want to like just log on to my, my ISP, my hosting environment, launch a VPS on, on Amazon and start scanning. What do I do? What are the things I need to know about? Uh, the first problem is knowing what the bandwidth limitations are. If you have a gigabit ethernet, you're actually only sending uh, about 48 or 476 megabits per second of actual traffic. And that's because ethernet has a pretty large overhead. And what scanning does, TCP scanning, is you send out lots of small packets probing the devices. So the per packet overhead is actually more than the contents of the packet. So when you do a gigabit ethernet, what you're 
ISP probably is going to charge you for is just the raw TCP IP overhead, which would be seven, 476 megabits per second. And by the way, this is a really high rate. So uh, that comes out to 1,488,000 packets per second, but in practice you're going to get a lot less. Switches just barf at that. And I haven't figured out why. I just know that when I connect, I get between 300,000 to maybe 800,000 packets per second. I'm not getting what Ethernet tells me I should get. Even on a well configured switch that's got nothing on it but, my, but me, I don't get the full bandwidth. I don't know why. Um, the billing issue is, is pretty interesting because different ISPs bill at different rates. Um, some ISPs don't seem to notice the small packets. Um, this one time we got, we, we did this whole scan of the internet and the ISP came back and said, yeah, but you've only used like a few megabytes total of traffic. And they weren't seeing our outbound traffic. Uh, some ISPs they'll give you unmetered links and that's pretty awesome because you can just go to your heart's content. Note that there's some other subtle issues here. Um, CCC in Germany, the CAS Computer Club, they do their annual thing. Uh, last year they had 100 gigabit connection to the internet, which I had other plans, but maybe this year I'll go and just bring a, my 10 gigabit Ethernet cards with me. But there are still problems because um, when you, we're shoving lots of small packets across the wire, and apparently that breaks agreements between peering agreements. So your ISP, no matter how wonderful they are, may still get mad at you. Um, there's the practical physical infrastructure. VPSs tend not to be able to handle the packet rate as off as much. Uh, it's, it's one of the strain the I/O gets strained. As I mentioned before, the Ethernet switches slow down quite a lot. Uh, also, be aware that just because the Ethernet switch says that it will accept 500,000 packets per second, doesn't mean that the rest of the infrastructure and all the hops out to the Internet will accept those. Um, scan it, all the scanners um, randomize the port numbers or the, the, the targets so that on the destination side you probably won't drop any packets. <coughs> the, the, the packet dropping happens on your side. So you need to scan some things and make sure, okay, I'm going to scan my own network across the internet, blast it with packet, and make sure if I send 10,000 packets that I receive 10,000 packets. Most of my scans run even less than that. Is I will run up multiple VPSs on different sites, different data centers and do a scan, like one in Tokyo, one in um, Dallas and one in Paris um, and do that instead of uh, blasting, one, blasting out a scan from one site. Uh, um, mass scan shards really easy. You just do dash dash shard one of five, two of five, three of five and it'll split the scan. Um, your biggest issue is abuse complaints. Um, the internet now is done in a way that when people do abusive things like um, spam um, or um, SEO optimization and stuff and scanning of websites, um, the complaints come back to the US to the ISPs and the ISPs will block them and, and, and cancel those customer accounts. And even if your ISP is nice and willing and wants you to scan from their network, they don't really have much choice because other organizations will just um, blacklist their entire address range, their entire um, AS number, or peering agreements will be able to stop peering with them. And so uh, even if your ISP is nice, still they don't have much choice in this. They can't let you do too much nasty stuff. And so part of that is responding to abuse complaints and um, answering them, which we'll get into. Uh, some things are worse than others. Doing a heart bleed scan these days with all the IDS detection out there saying someone's exploiting me, um, that gets a lot. So we, we've been doing a heart bleed scan once a month now for the past several months, which by the way there's about 300,000 systems vulnerable. And that's generated a huge amount of complaints. Uh, by the way, we've also run a Tor exit node. That's actually generated more complaints than just the heart bleed scan. So still, that's the relative level. Uh, HTTP scan tends to put you on the fail to ban lists. So uh, put something nice in your user registry. That's one of the configuration options, dash dash user agent. So that, um, say something nice like you know, we're doing a research scan. Uh, and then uh, various IDSs have rules and stuff and it's, it's nice to try to evade them 
not to, um, to try to get away with something evil, but change your signature of what you're doing to evade them so you just don't make people upset. Uh, sadly, and this is a bad thing, is today's um, methodology for monitoring the network tends to monitor the inbound stuff. There's this old joke about this guy is looking on the ground and looking for something. And his friend asks, well, what are you looking for? And he says, well, I dropped my, my keys over there and I can't find them. And his friend asks, but why are you looking over here? And the guy says, well, the light's better over here. And, and that's, what I, that's what most organizations do these days is they monitor the inbound attacks for hackers because the light's better. Because they, you put an IDS on the wire and immediately you, you see a, a, alerts coming up because people are, there's always this background radiation of someone's doing something on the internet sending you packets and you'll get events. The light's better on the inbound side. But the detection you really want is on the outbound side. What is all the response? So, for example, one of the abuse complaints we get from Heartbleed uh, is please take us off your, your scanning list. And we look in our data and the data they're give, the addresses they're giving us are ones that are vulnerable to Heartbleed. So they're monitoring our inbound stuff <laughs> saying that are you vulnerable and not monitoring the outbound stuff saying yes we are. And that's really, really bad. So as I mentioned before, ISPs must take this seriously. One of the biggest things is the DOD gets really, really angry. <laughs> and when you've got people in suits show up at the ISP's office and say, we're seeing traffic from you and we don't want to, um, they, the pressure then comes down on us where they say, yeah, these address ranges need to be excluded. The exclude is pretty easy. It's the same way as Nmap which is um, you just have a, a configuration file, uh, either a file containing an exclude list or just add to your configuration parameters and um, just keep adding them. And uh, it supports comments. So we just have this long exclude list of, of address ranges. Whenever people send us an abuse mail and we say, yes, hello, we're just doing uh, research scanning, we'll happily take you off the list if you want. And they give us their IP address range. And then we add to this list. Now one of the cool things that we wish we could do is to have a public exclude list. But most everyone who sends us a request to be taken off our list doesn't want that to be known publicly. So, and, yeah, a, a funny aside about this. So everybody says, uh, take me off your list because I'm worried someone will be able to go look up what my IP ranges are <laughs> for my organization so they can hack me. Fortunately, bgp.he.net has all this information publicly available in a really nice, easily searchable format, which is occasionally necessary when they don't want to tell you their ranges, but they still want you to stop scanning them. Which is a, I don't understand. Yeah. And Paul's got the block list open. Um, <laughs> sorry. So Paul's got the part of the block list open. And one of the other things that's really fun is people will run IDS and IPS sensors on whole different subnet masks and different net blocks and different ISPs. And they have automated complaint messages that come in and say, dear so-and-so, you're doing malicious activity. Sorry, I didn't know a single SIN packet was malicious, but you know, whatever. Um, oh, it's malicious. A single SIN packet's malicious, the internet is over. Um, <laughs> but uh, they would write in a complaint and say, take these net blocks off your list, or take us off your list and give us no information at all. Um, and in one particular case, uh, we had to go back and forth three or four times with them because they didn't their automated messages uh, asked us to take their publicly known, straightforward front end IP addresses off their lists, but their sensors were on different lists. So we kept doing scans and their sensors would keep picking up scans and keep complaining for us to take off IPs that were already in the block list. And we're like, we don't know what you guys are, take your crack back to the dealer, you got bad crack. <laughs> like, <laughs> tell them you want better crack, stop. So it's, it's bizarre and when you scan the whole internet you get a massive grab bag of random. Like every possible ridiculous thing that can happen will. And every scan you do, like you think, we have like several pages now long with multiple huge site or net blocks of stuff we're leaving off the scans. And uh, every single time we do a scan, like I'm doing a scan right now on the uh, port 62078, the iPhone backdoor port. There are 542,000 IPs responding. That doesn't necessarily mean they're iPhones. It just means there's something that's responding. Um, but I'm going to get abuse complaints and I, I hope that 
Maybe some come in while we're on stage and I can share them because they're insane. <laughs> some of them. And one of the things is, is people, a lot of defenders, don't believe that you are scanning the entire internet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. They, have a, they have their company and they've got some well-known addresses that are identifiably belonging to them, but they've also got the secret subnet over there that no one's supposed to know also belongs to them. And then they see you, your scan go evenly across the entire, all those ranges. And so their conclusion is, oh my God, they're hacking me because they know me, they're targeting me, because how else would they've known to associate that sub secret subnet to our, our main subnetwork? And so they're convinced that, that, that we're hacking them. There's a really cool story about six months ago, I was on a podcast uh, with this guy um, who was going to be one of the hosts. And the night before, I just launched a scan of the internet. And he starts tweeting how he was woken up on an emergency conference call because they were getting hacked. And oh, no. um, he had to c calm him down, talk him down, and go back to sleep. And now apparently he says that whenever I do a scan, the, the a ticket gets opened up. It immediately gets closed. It's, it's just Rob scanning again. <laughs> Uh, this is a great story, uh, and I think I think this would be oh. the best one to tell it. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, this this yeah. was this was a good time. Um, so going back to abuse complaints um, and dealing with um, people complaining, like I said, it's a grab bag and you get a lot of random stuff. Um, I have a friend of mine who runs the operation in which I'm hosted, and he's my ISP. So he's been very kind in letting me do this sort of scanning. Not a lot of people will let you do this. If you go to any of the major providers and say, hi, I want to use like 800 meg a second to scan the internet, they're like, ha ha ha, no. Um, so I wanted to work with him and be very open about what I was doing and when I was scanning and what I was scanning so that if he got weird, bizarre complaints and he had to deal with the crazy, that he was better prepared to deal with the scenario. Um, so I did a scan for something. I think it was VNC. I don't remember. It was um, ShmooCon this year in like February. And we were the three of us were sat in like lobby conning it till three in the morning doing our scans. And the next morning um, before the talk, I started getting phone calls from my ISP. And he was like, hey, um, we got some abuse letters and we want to insulate you from this customer or from this person because he's kind of belligerent. Um, and I said, okay, well, you know, what can I do? He says, just add these IP addresses to your block list and be done with it. All right, fine. So uh, a few minutes later, he called me again. He says, You're, we're still getting complaints. And I said, that's. We do the scan and we get complaints randomly for the next week because people don't check their logs immediately, right? And one guy from Australia, it's got to be an Australian, right? Um, decided that he was so upset that I literally sent a single SIN packet to his systems. Um, and when he sent him in his complaint, my ISP guy was cordial and responded and said, hi, you know, we're doing internet research. This is all open. You can see this website where this guy has everything documented. And I put it all up on my site. Like, here's where I'm doing my research and here's the intention and here's how you can contact me. And because I guess he deals with so much random crap on his in, in, in ingress interface, um, we were the only people to ever respond to uh, a, an abuse complaint from him. He like unleashed this torrent of crazy on us. <laughs> and it was like opening the fucking floodgates. And he, up to and including, was screaming at these people on the phone saying he was going to call the internet police. And I went, no, you're lying to me. <laughs> and he's like, no, we swear. He was threatening to call the internet police. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Three hours later, I own internetpolice.us and now my scans come from internetpolice.us. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you have to know how to work the crazy. So now, yeah, all my scanning comes from internetpolice.us and the scan that I'm running right now, that I'm scanning the iPhone port, if you're on... Your thing's not working. What? I don't know. Oh, did it break? Apparently your site's down. Oh, uh, boo. I'll fix it in a sec. Yeah, we should fix it. Um, okay, but um, yeah, it's so like right now if you have um, – oh, and I, we, I should also say that we're, we're also going to be doing se probably several live scans um, while we're here. And if you have a Verizon device and I think AT&T, your phone is directly connected to the internet and we will be touching you. <laughs> Against your will, wherever your phone may be. Um, yeah, so I found – 912,000 devices apparently responding to this port. Um, and I should say that um, I guess I, Rob's probably going to get to it. The, um, there's a million or so, or is it two million devices that respond to everything? 
So like that's a whole separate rabbit hole of a project is going and finding every load balancer, firewall, um, router, and other device that responds to absolutely everything because um, usually when you do this kind of work you have to do it in multiple passes. So we use mass scan for the first sweep to see if the port is open and then if the port is open then there's like a secondary process where we decide what to do with the open port. So like if you're scanning for Redis for example, um, there's a ton of open Redis instances on the internet and from there you connect to it and issue the monitor command and then sometimes it asks you for credentials in which case you ignore it and other times it gives you credit card numbers and Facebook session cookies and Twitter session cookies and what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. um, they have these gnarly hardened front ends with like two A SSL certificates and credentialing and OAuth. Um, o, um, o, what is it? OAuth. OAuth. OAuth yeah. and, and they really harden the front end but then they have this transport mechanism that's completely public unencrypted on the internet so you can bypass all of that and see like hey look these are credit cards what am I doing? Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, in, in you do it in stages, right? So what we found out was when the secondary pass would go through and we would find a substantially lower number of th things that the first sweep um, produced. So the first sweep would produce several million results and the second sweep would say, well, out of those several million results you have like 200,000 living hosts and we're like, that's bizarre. What's the deal? So we started testing it by hand and it turns out that there's devices that just listen on every port and respond to everything. And I'm like, it's 2014 and people don't know what a sin flood is and they're configuring their devices to just answer to everything. So I'm thinking that like we're doing these, we're in a, you know, in the hotel lobby tinkering around at three in the morning and somewhere there's a guy with his head on fire because his IDS went down or his firewall went down because somebody configured it to, I think Checkpoint's guilty of this too. They have these settings where, oh yeah, this is going to block NMAP. We'll just respond to everything and it'll confuse the scanners. And we're like, we're scanning with like eight gigs a second. <laughs> um, Not good for you. You might want to rethink this strategy. <laughs> Let's see how it works out for him, Cotton, right? So yeah, one of my fun. favorite complaints I get back is the one saying uh, to the effect of we've blocked you at the firewall, neener, neener. <laughs> <laughs> of like, I don't care. I don't even know who you are. I don't really care. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things is how how broken organizations are. There's this um, financial worry financial group, which apparently is classified a national security objective facility class A, as they repeatedly tell me every time I do a scan. Um, and I, it's in Korea, and I have no idea what that is. But what they usefully do is they um, CC their entire organization on the abuse emails. Oh, yeah. You had one job. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want a list of sysadmins that you want to fish for that organization, <laughs> well, here's a friendly list that they ni so nicely give us. Um, so yeah, so work closely with your ISP. Be nice to them. That, it, so that's the same story we have here with, for all of us as we work closely with the ISPs. Uh, we use the swipe or the swoop feature, the Share Who Is project, to get like an IP address range that's assigned to us, so that when you do the reverse lookup, all the abuse comes to us and not to our ISP. So usually, we handle usually about half the complaints will CC our ISP anyway, even though they have our contact info. They just want to CC everybody. I got one that was CC'd to Postmaster at the domain that I was sending email f that the contact info was from, which was completely unassociated with the IPs that I was scanning from. They, they just they CC everyone that comes back in any kind of a lookup. So expect that, you know. Don't use your work email if you're the postmaster at work is going to be worried about this. Internet police US is up again. Yeah, so oh. Apache wasn't running. Derp. Oh. Derp indeed. You're doing it wrong. It works oh, for me. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Also, um, if you scroll down a little bit, there's that like it's it's in little gray. I need to fix it. It's file a complaint, which I, I need to like do something with this because you can file a complaint and it's a form that goes to nowhere. But <laughs> <laughs> you should probably fix that, Dan. Yeah. No, no, that was intentional, but like. <laughs> I'm now thinking like, yeah, I have to deal with like silly people trying to troll me with like shitty XSS and, S and SQLi or whatever but like I can't imagine if people have tried to fill this form out and what went into it because that would be like a whole Tumblr feed, like security <laughs> reactions, just what goes in that form. Yeah. 
That would be so rad. <laughs> yeah, so right now, right now, as we speak, I'm doing a scan, and right now there are assisted men running around scrambling, screaming, and the internet police is scanning us. Well. Just wait. <laughs> hopefully, they've, hopefully they've caught on by now and are not as... I don't know. You'd be surprised. No, or maybe wouldn't, you wouldn't. Actually. <laughs> Uh, so you can also do anonymous VPS if you want to be a jerk and pay with uh, Bitcoin and stuff. Uh, some will allow you to complete your scan um, and uh, before they cancel your account. Some will just, uh, like Line Node, will cancel you very, very quickly. And so like, your $50 deposit, you'll just get canceled immediately. Line Node is actually pretty friendly. If you're a well-known, verifiable organization and you scan at slow rates, they actually are quite friendly to this whole thing. It's, but they're not friendly to the whole anonymous VPS do, do bad stuff. So I wanted to quickly talk about MassScan itself. It's just like Nmap, but not. Um, the biggest thing is that Nmap does a, a, what's called a synchronous scan. It does a host at a time. It, it starts the scan, waits for the response, sends re, um, retries if it doesn't get back the expected response, and that's what slows it down. What MassScan does is it just blasts out packets the packets and never waits for a response. And that's why I can send out four billion packets because it doesn't have four billion records in memory waiting for the response. It doesn't care, it doesn't know. And what it's using is sync cookies so that to, to validate the responses that come back that match what it thinks it, it might have sent. So this allows you to be a thousand times faster. It's not a technology uh, thing, it's just um, it's a common thing throughout, like it's the same difference as between Apache and Nginx. Apache is an asynchronous server, can handle a lot more connections than Apache can. Um, Nmap of course is a way better scanner. If you're scanning a few hosts, Nmap is just totally better. The only reason that you're using MassScan is because of you want to do million node networks or billion node networks. The annoying thing about MassScan is that it has its own TCP IP stack. Uh, even when you run it just as a normal mode, it's still going off and doing its own TCP IP stack bypassing the underlying system. And so you get little weird things you don't notice, like there's duplicate ARPs. Um, the biggest problem is when you're doing um, banner checking, where you want to establish a TCP connection, send an HTTP request, and get the response and record the response. Uh, the normal stack will uh, reset those connections. So you have to um, do a firewall rule to block that. Uh, or use a different IP address. So all of our scans, we scan from one machine, but then uh, we have a, another IP address that we're scanning from that's separate from our machine. It's not used by any machine. And we just use source IP or adapter IP and set that as our IP address and scan from that. And then we don't have any uh, firewall rules to worry about. Uh, so the, the basic configuration is, is set your, if you don't want to rely upon the defaults, if you're having problems, you set them manually with the source IP, the source port, and you have to configure the router MAC address. Uh, or the, usually the router IP just works because it will ARP it. Uh, so banner checking is the fun stuff with, um, with mass scan. So mass scan will go off, check the ports, that's your basic scan, but usually you want to get more data. like. Uh, SSL certificates or HTTP headers. And that's where you need to establish the connection and prevent the reset from killing the connection. Uh, we don't support like NSC cell scripting, but there's a lot of stuff you can do. If all you want to do is check for one protocol that's odd, put, the, put it into a file and then do dash dash hello string, that file name, and it will just shove that data across the port when it connects with TCP. So if you've got some weird protocol, like some weird industrial control protocol in a weird port, that's an easy way to find just that industrial control protocol, uh, bypass, uh, but uh, ignoring all those systems that just respond with a SYNAC with nothing. Um, one of the cool things is that you can do, uh, you can break apart a scan, you can shard it. So if you've got 50 different machines, you can just do shard one of 52, 53, 50 across the machines. Uh, you can use multiple IP addresses as a range. If you've got a class C and you just want to use all those IP addresses, you just type all of them in or type in the range. Um, the same thing with a port. You can do a, a range of source ports. Um, so, yeah, so we, we're sitting around doing our three day or our days talking uh, until 3 a.m. In, in the morning, drinking, and we're imagining, yes, we can also do this. 
If you want to sin flood someone with all IP addresses from the internet, that could be your source range. Your ISP might not allow it, might do egress filtering, so it might not work, but in theory, the, the scanner can do it. The 90s are alive and well right here. <laughs> Uh, also, it can do load testing. The uh, a really cool feature is infinite, which yeah, it, cra it does crash firewalls a lot. I've done that recently, and um, next generation firewalls that do deep packet inspection, ooh, they get angry. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was at a client site several like months ago, or, yeah, and um, they were putting in new fancy pants firewalls, and I said I have an idea. So like with Dinky laptop. I go, okay, um, mass scan to a network on the other side of the firewall that doesn't exist, um, just scan. Um, one NGFW uh, had Active Directory authentication and um, all of its little gauges went to 100% and AD broke and it never came back. <laughs> and uh, another one just went to 100% dropped a lot of packets but as soon as I controlled seed out of mass scan it came back to life. So yes, it, this is a wonderful firewall load testing tool. So, testing tool. Like, it breaks clouds too. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, um, I overflowed. A, I may have overflowed a cam table and a switch at a client once with it too by mistake. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> it, so that's the optimization we're doing with the whole asynchronous, the asynchronous thing. Is it for us is a billion connections in a few minutes. That's yeah, no problem. But the devices start straining at a hundred thousand connections, and so they just everything falls over. But the infinite feature is cool because you just type dash dash infinite and it, when it completes the scan, I'll just restart it. And if all the TCP connections are open from the previous scan, they remain open. So you can create easily 100 million, I mean, yeah, 100 million even, uh, concurrent connections. And nothing else handles that right now. Uh, by the way, no one ever uses this, but I always output to binary format. That's the slash OB parameter. And then read it later with the uh, dash rescan of that to then output to XML or JSON or text or some other format. Uh, no one ever uses that but me, but I want to mention it. Um, so, one of the cool things, uh, Paul was mentioning this when we were talking about the talk, that should work. Uh, I'd never done it before, but um, it's really cool. You can uh, receive on one IP address, like a burner phone, and then you transmit from like a colo, it's got a gigabit connection. And then you spoof the IP address from the colo of the phone. So all the packets go out to the internet at a very high rate, and then the responses come back at a very low rate to the phone. And what's cool about that is the abuse complaints don't go back to your colo account, they go to the phone. <laughs> so I did that. I went out and got a T Mobile phone, a T Mobile um, chip, put it in my little. Uh, Ninja telephone from two years ago, <laughs> from which I can run mass gang because I jailbroken it, compiled the command line. Um, but it, uh, the ninja, that didn't work because T Mobile throws you through a firewall. I could not get the, all the responses coming back through the firewall. Uh, Clear has a uh, uh, direct access to the network. They also have a firewall, so uh, it can't, the SINs can't come in, but the Synax can come in just fine. So Clear works great for that. T-Mobile doesn't. We don't know about Verizon and AT&T. I think Verizon does have you directly on the internet, so that it will work with Verizon prepaid phones and stuff like that. But um, all I've actually verified working is is this. And and by the way, it works really cool because uh, Mascan. What you do is you set the same seed. So Mascan randomizes the parameters, randomizes the uh, sync cookies. I just had a thought. So NSA is scanning all intercontinental traffic. You want to make them really mad? <laughs> set up your phone. Yeah, this will do intercontinentally. Yeah, set up your phone on the other side of some ocean and just send all the results over there and watch them. What the hell is going on? Yes. Just a thought, you know. So if you're bored. But you can still do the banner checking. So we, so the so the device, the mask on one end, because that's again the asynchronous nature, it gets a synac. It checks to see if it matches the seed, and if it does, it will then establish the TCP connection. So you can do complicated scans like pulling down everyone's certificates or a heart bleed scan or something, and all from this device. But the the massive gigabit per second is on these other servers potentially, um, just blasting the whole internet. Okay, let's talk about some results. <laughs> so uh, what Paul here did, and it's really cool. 
uh, is he uh, set up a little script to then download the image. And he, um, so here's an example of. So you probably can't see, you probably can't read the title of that window. It says, I blanked out where it is, County Warrant Processing System. Something or other state strong. police. The derp is very strong. <laughs> um, this one went away pretty quickly when I called my per contact and said, hey, you know, we should probably do something about this. <laughs> uh, but there's stuff like this all over the results. And, you know, this is probably someone who is all kinds of compliant with all the local regs except that they didn't seem to think that a remote desktop protocol with no password was a problem. <laughs> so Paul's got lots of cool results. We'll get, hopefully get to more. Um, another one was um, Heartbleed. We do a Heartbleed scan. And there's still 300,000 systems vulnerable. And so here's a list of the uh, subject names coming back from, the, from here. And what we can see is, is they're, they're not websites that are vulnerable. It's things like Synology NASs. That's the TS series NAS down at the bottom. Uh, 10,000 of those. Uh, there's also a Synology box. There's a HIC vision, which is cameras. So there's all these devices out there that are vulnerable that you would never find if you come in via the DNS name that you'd only scan via the IP addresses. Uh, but, but there are some websites that are vulnerable. And like one long list, uh, start with secure dot some domain. Uh, some I think are honeypots like Nanog, which is the North American network operators group or something. Um, there's a guy who's doing mainframe scanning and found lots of cool mainframes. I didn't want to include any of his pics here, but they're, they're really rad to see what mainframes are on the internet. That guy has a Tumblr and his mainframes. Like yeah. live mainframes. Like what Just are you, why is this them. on the internet? DMV and like pharmacies and stuff. What are you doing? Yeah. Okay, so let's try to do a live demo here. How many goats did you sacrifice to the demo gods? The answer is always not enough. <laughs> so, yeah, so right before this talk, for some reason our servers have not wanted to respond. So like here's our service, internetsurvey2.arasec.com. That's the one we do where most of our scans from, and it's not responding to me. So I'm gonna have Paul log onto his server and do a demo. Um, give me another like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So well, I mean, we can, I'll start talking about what's going on while the configuration script is running. So uh, I this I lost access to the service that I was going to be doing this demo from, and only got it back about two hours ago. So uh, my configuration scripts have been running and installing the distributed scanner that I built. The way this works is that it runs mass scan from a host that's friendly to run mass scan on. Uh, come talk to me afterwards if you want hosting recommendations. And it scans port 5900, uh, which is VNC. And I started that about 15, 20 minutes ago, and I think it's just about done with the whole internet now. The follow-up processing <laughs> is a set of cloud images that don't run SIN scans. What they do is they take the results of the mass scan output uh, through a queue, through a Redis queue, and just shave off a result, go take, go try to connect to the VNC, Try, you know, speak the VNC protocol. If the VNC protocol says, you know, says you may connect without authentication, because most VNC says you need a password. But if it says you may connect without authentication, it's a very explicit thing. We're not, you know, hacking into something that's not authorized. Then it goes and puts it back in the queue and takes a screenshot of it. You know, just logs in, VNC screenshots it, and puts it back out into the queue. I, the results, when they start flowing in, will be available at results.survey.tx.ai. I don't know if they're up yet. It doesn't look like it. I'm uh, waiting for the screenshot machines to come back up. TX.ai. Um, uh, what, what I, oh, you're not on the DEF CON network. You won't be able to get to it unless you're on the DEF CON network. I'm on the DEF CON network. Are you on the DEF CON network? I'm on this, whatever this Ethernet cable is. Oh, uh, you're probably coming from a different egress IP. Let me fix that for you. Uh, 
So as the, real, as the results come in, they get, they just flow through this queue and the beautiful thing is we can scale this follow up processing as wide as we want. Um, I normally would have about 100 cloud workers running to do this process. I haven't gotten it scaled up yet because they only just got installed here. But you know, they cost me 16 cents an hour so it's perfectly reasonable to spin them up for a job like this and then tear them down when you're done with them. Here, if you can add that. Like oh, that's uh, my silly Verizon one. Oh, okay. So if, if you can't quite do a live demo yet, how about you? It's, it's loading. Loading. Oh, um. Uh, uh, you won't be able to see the results you're looking for in this oh, okay. right now. Give me another minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, they need five minutes. They're not ready. Okay. Well, in the meanwhile, so, uh, we'll just do a scan from the DEF CON network. We'll see how much they like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine they'll notice. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah so we, can, we can do a slow course. scan. So, mass scan. Uh, do, uh, let's do like the 23 is a big How hosting to piss environment. Off the wall of sheep. We can do like port 80, and um, we can do a, a slow packet rate of just like 10 packets per second. But it's really cool because we start getting results immediately. That's one of the cool things about mass scan versus nmap um, is that nmap waits until the entire host scan is done. And it does a ping, it then does some other checks, and it takes a while. So when you scan a sub network, it takes a while before you get any result. You start your nmap scan, you go away for a coffee and come back, realize you made a mistake in the configuration parameters, do it again, and it's uh, an iterative process. But one of the cool things with mass scan is because it's just a port at a time. I don't ping first, I don't do anything first, I just send that, that, that port request. So even at a slow late, a rate like 10,000 packets per second, um, they just start coming back. And if we just want to do a little bit more obnoxiousness, like 10,000 packets per second, I'm sure they won't mind. So actually, it doesn't look like it's much faster. But that's because this whole screen is taking thousands of response, dumping them to the screen, and then doing the next one second update. But that's the little thing that reports there at the bottom of the, of the left hand side is how many packets per second successfully doing. I should probably stop this. <laughs> Which is actually really bad because 20, so 23 is the range I test with because there's lots of hosting environments, there's Amazon there, there's Akamai, there's a bunch of other web servers out there. So I know that there's always something listening on port 80. And I don't get any abuse complaints back from that, that range. So they're a good thing to test with. But we can also do something like this. So one of the things I do with mass scan and it's kind of boss, is that um, I warn you that this, you, you probably misfingered something and you probably don't want to scan the entire internet. So I make you actually exclude uh, one address. So, so I'm now doing 10, 000, 10 packets per second. But even now, 10 packets per second across the entire internet, we already get back one result. Those, those look like Microsoft this. minutes. But uh, one of the cool things is, is it does give you a time a time of of how long remaining. Now, ten packets per second. That remaining is going to be a long time. It's like it's like when you copy a file in Windows ninety five. But it's really cool <laughs> <laughs> when you you type in that zero 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 slash zero, the zero subnet, meaning the the internet. Um, and at a much faster rate, like a million packets per second, and it tells you, yeah, it's about an hour. Yeah, for reference, I'm getting 690,000 packets a second on my scan that's going right now, and it, I started it as I walked in, and it was telling me an hour and 20 minutes. Can and that's you, just on like a modest gig pipe. Can we connect that to the VGA port? Uh, all I have is HDMI. So if we can sort that out somehow. Can sure. you screen that and have me log into your machine and pop uh, that up? Oh, well, there we go. Okay, the results are starting to flow in. The Yay. so uh, results.survey.tx.ai. So now I need to scale this out in the cloud. Uh, but we're starting to get results now. Um, well, you might be. 
Okay, what's, what's your IP address? Okay. 172.18.9. Well, my IP is 192.168.01. Why can't you add me? <laughs> because someone got mad last time I did this and gave, exposed it to the whole public internet, so I figure <laughs> I'll just expose it to all of DEF CON and then they can't complain. Uh, Okay, so what's that IP address? 7014. So by the way, Mascan does, um, one thing that's also boss about Mascan um, is it's Let's just again. Uh, make, well, we got getting errors here, but um, it compiles on Mac OS Windows. Well, um, there's some results that all you guys can go look at. The results. That yeah, everybody, DSA everybody AI. except for you apparently can see them. Can can one of you who's in the room who has a laptop see if you can get to that? Yeah. Are you seeing results there? Yeah. 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 Cool. So so here's the thing about <laughs> about here's the rule of DefCon is we call them the demo gods or the demo demons, is that even when your demo is actually working, something does okay, not work. Try it now. <laughs> What? <laughs> okay. Here oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. Well, it's working. Some of you can get it, but I can't get it. Okay. What's your What's your IP, Rob? Well, it's. Um, oh, there's those Korean billboards again. Oh yeah. So apparently, there's like a swath of billboards in Korea that are advertising and. Once I do that, eighteen. Can't really see, but forty-six. You know, it's up a lot on the screen Korean. down there. And. This is one of those opportunities where, like, you think of Hollywood movies and you're saying, well, so I'm looking at a billboard that's probably in a really big public place and, hmm, you know, <laughs> oh, exploitable, the trolling opportunities. Um, I should stay away from the Korean ranges because it's all the same. Go through the browser. I think your routing is funky. Actually, here. Fuck it. We'll just do it from my machine because we'll we're about live. out of time. Can we just hook up the uh, yeah. video? Yeah. Do you have a. Um, you bring your machine up here. So, a any last minute questions, by the way? Question over there? Yeah, it's open source. I probably should have mentioned that before and had a link to it. Uh, it's on GitHub. So if you just Google GitHub masking, you'll probably find it. But it's GitHub slash uh, Robert David Graham, my name, slash Mascan. <laughs> so the question is for IPv6, and the, the implications are it's going to not really work. There are some things we can do knowing how IPv6 allocates addresses and you can maybe do target ranges. Oh, nice. <laughs> well done. So So to be clear, these are all this is the these are all results is, that have been dynamically found while we've been on stage while they've been furiously or? typing. This is a train. Yeah, we gotta go though. Bye. So check Oh my god. <laughs> so look at the results. They're up there. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> well done. <laughs>